I'm David Gassner, and this is Developing Android Apps Essential Training. This course is designed for developers who want to build mobile apps with the Android 5 SDK and Android Studio. I'll start by describing how to create new Android Studio projects and connect virtual and physical devices for testing. I'll then describe how to define an app's screens with activities and layouts, and how to use images that work on a variety of screen sizes and pixel densities. I'll demonstrate both XML and Java-based code that handles events and lets you implement your app's logic. I'll show you how to affect your app's appearance with styles and themes, and how to implement Google's new Material Design Visual Language. And I'll show you how to create an app with multiple screens that lets the user interact with data sets. I hope that this course helps you get started building your own Android apps. Android is a complete software stack that includes the operating system and an application framework that lets you build apps that can be distributed through the Google Play Store, the Amazon App Store, and other channels. When you build Android apps, you'll be programming with Java and XML. And the more you know about these languages, the more effective you can be as an Android developer. Android supports a custom version of Java. Its syntax is primarily based on Java 6, with some syntax enhancements from Java 7. Advanced Java syntax is used, such as inner classes and anonymous classes. If you're brand new to Java, I recommend watching the course Java Essential Training. And to learn about some of these more advanced features of Java, watch the course Java Advanced Training. That course in particular covers some features that were brand new to Java 7 that are supported in the latest versions of the Android SDK. You'll also be working with XML files in Android. You'll use XML for application configuration and for resource management. You'll need to understand basic XML vocabulary. What's the difference between an element and an attribute? and so on. If you're new to XML, I recommend watching the course XML Essential Training. And as you get deeper into Android, you can learn how to work with Java and XML together with the more advanced course XML Integration with Java. Finally, you'll be working with Android Studio, the official IDE for Android development from Google that's based on IntelliJ IDEA from JetBrains. There's a complete course available on how to work with Android Studio, Android Studio Essential Training. So as you have questions about the IDE, I recommend looking back at that course. The older Android Developer Tools, or ADT plugin for Eclipse, is no longer supported by Google. So to be effective as an Android developer, you'll need to get up to speed on Android Studio. You'll also need to set up some software on your system to follow along with the course's examples. First, you'll need Java. On Windows, install the latest version of the Java Developer Kit, or JDK, from Oracle. As of the time of this recording, that was Java 8. On Mac OS X, you'll need Java for OS X from Apple. That version is based on Java 6 and is needed to run Android Studio on Mac. But you should also install the latest JDK from Oracle. That's the version you'll use to build and compile your Android apps and you'll need Android Studio. All of the software you need is completely free and downloadable without registering with the software's creators. To test your apps, you should have at least one Android device, preferably a cell phone. This course focuses mostly on the most recent version, Android 5 or Lollipop, but if you only have a phone running some version of Android 4, such as Jelly Bean or KitKat, that's fine. Most of what I'll show in this course will work on those versions of Android as well. And of course, you can test on any version of Android by creating an Android Virtual Device, or AVD, for use with the Android emulator. When deciding what devices to use for testing, here are some tips. Google Nexus devices offer a pure Android experience. You'll get the pure Android operating system as designed by Google without any additions or enhancements that are added by some of the hardware vendors. You might also decide to test on Samsung devices. They have the largest single share of the device market, at least in North America. 
and Kindle Fire devices support testing of features that are unique to the Amazon ecosystem. If possible, it's useful to have multiple devices, a variety of phones and tablets. But of course, not all developers will be able to do that. So once again, I recommend getting used to using the Android emulator to simulate as broad a variety as you need to test your apps. This course is accompanied by exercise files that you can use to follow along with the demonstrations. I've copied the exercise files to my desktop, but you can place them anywhere on your hard disk. The exercise files are organized by chapter. Most of the chapter folders contain subfolders, and each of these folders is an Android Studio project. Within each of these subfolders, you'll find subfolders named App and Gradle. There's also a subfolder called .idea, but it's only visible on Windows. It's hidden on Mac. In order to open one of these projects from within Android Studio, start at the welcome screen and click Open an existing Android Studio project. Then, navigate to your exercise files. On Mac OS X, you'll be in a Finder window. Go to your Exercise Files folder. On Windows, you can start by typing Desktop, and that'll take you to your Desktop folder, and then you can open the Desktop folder and see your Exercise Files, and from there, drill down to the folder you're interested in. Then click on that folder, make sure it has an icon indicating that this is an Android Studio project, and click OK. Each of these subfolders, that is, each of these projects, can be opened on either Windows, Mac OS X, or on Linux. Once you've opened the folder, you can see its directory structure by clicking on the Project tab. Then, change to the Project view and click on the spinner icon to open the directory structure, and you'll see exactly the same directory structure that you see in Finder or in Explorer. To run the app, you'll need a device either a virtual device or a physical device. Early in the course, I'll describe how to create your own virtual devices using the AVD Manager. If you already have a device open or a physical device connected, you can then run the app by clicking the Run button on the toolbar or by going through the menu. Be patient. The first time you run an app after opening it, Android Studio has some work to do creating additional support files that are unique to your computer. But once that work is done, a dialog box will pop up that lets you choose the particular device you want to test on. Right now, I have my emulator running a virtual device that mimics the Nexus 5, and I have a physical device, a Nexus 6, also attached to my computer. I can run the app on both devices at the same time by pressing the Shift key and selecting the devices, and then clicking OK and after a few moments, the app should run on your device. Again, be patient the first time you run an app. It takes a few moments for Android Studio to package the app, copy the package to the device, and then issue the command to run it. In addition to the starting projects, the Exercise Files folder also has a Solutions folder, and you'll find the finished versions of each of the demonstrations here. You can open those in Android Studio in exactly the same way. There's also an Assets folder that contains subfolders such as Data, Icon, Images, and Starting Project. I'll use many of these assets throughout the course, but not all of them. Some of them are just there to work with as you experiment with creating your own Android apps. Google revises Android Studio frequently, and this can lead to incompatibilities between the exercise files and certain elements of this course. Here are some tips for certain known errors. When you open a project from the course's exercise files, you might run into an incompatibility between the version of Gradle that's supported in your copy of Android Studio and some files that are included with the exercise file projects. When you open the project from the exercise files, you might see this dialog box asking you to import the project from Gradle. Instead of trying to import this way, cancel the process. And then, here are two possible solutions. 
First, instead of opening the projects, choose the option to import the projects instead. This option is labeled on the welcome screen as Import Projects, Eclipse ADT, Gradle, etc. But it can be used on existing Android Studio projects as well. Choose the project in exactly the same way as you do when opening it, navigating to the project folder and selecting that folder. Using this option, you might see that the projects open just fine. If you continue to have problems, you might have to delete your Gradle folder. This is a folder that's stored inside your home directory on either Mac or Windows. Go to a command prompt or to terminal on Mac and then switch to your home directory under users. Then on Windows execute this command and on Mac this one. Then restart Android Studio and open one of the projects. The project should now open just fine. You might find that it takes a while to open the project the first time. That's because Android Studio has to re-download the Gradle components and you will need internet connectivity to do this. The second troubleshooting tip is about layout design. An Android XML layout defines the appearance of a screen and Android Studio has a nice preview capability that lets you see what the layout file might look like. With the introduction of API 22, that's Android 5.1, Android Studio started showing this error, rendering problems exception raised during rendering, action bar. And this happens when you open an XML layout file in preview mode. To solve this, change your API level back to API 21. You can do this through a drop down menu in the preview screen, and it looks like this. When you switch to API 21, you now should see that the preview works. So those are two useful troubleshooting tips. As we find other issues that appear in future versions of Android Studio, we'll show them in this video. The name Android is commonly used to refer to an operating system. And that's accurate, but it's also incomplete. It includes the operating system, which is based on Linux, but is specifically designed to be run on mobile devices, such as cell phones and tablets. And in addition to the operating system, the Android platform or software stack includes a complete application framework that lets you create and deploy your own custom apps. For developers, the most critical part of this software stack is called the Android SDK. It includes all of the tools you need to create and package those apps, including compilers, debugging tools, and more. The compiler, builds and packages apps for distribution. There are debugging tools that let you test and refine your apps, and a whole set of libraries that encapsulate critical functionality that you can use and reuse to build your apps. And there's the development tools. Most importantly, Android Studio, a complete integrated development environment. Android has come a long way since its origins. The first version was released in late 2008, Version 1 included a web browser, support for cameras on phones, and many Google services, including Search, Google Maps, synchronization of Gmail, contacts, and other services, instant messaging, a media player, and more. Version 1.1 was released just a few months later, in February of 2009, and it included improvements to Google Maps, showing and hiding the dial pad, saving attachments from emails and other new features. The next version of Android was 1.5 and it was the first one that had a code name for a delicious dessert. This was Cupcake in April 2009. It improved support for videos, added a home screen architecture, application widgets, copy and paste in the web browser, and many other new features. The next version was 1.6 or Donut in September of 2009. This version expanded the number of features available for multi-touch devices and added an integrated image gallery. Eclair came along in October 2009 and that was version 2.0. It added support for multiple Google accounts, upgraded to Bluetooth 2.1, added support for Microsoft Exchange, searching of SMS messages, 
and supported more screen sizes to better support the variety of devices that were coming onto the market. The next version was 2.2, or Froyo. And as you'll see later, this is the most recent version of Android that's still actively used in the wild. It was released in May 2009, and it significantly speeded up the operating system and improved memory management. In Chrome, the web browser that's included with Android, the new JavaScript engine named V8 was added, and other features were added including USB tethering and Wi-Fi hotspots. Version 2.3, or Gingerbread, came along in December of 2010. And this was the last version that was exclusively targeted at cell phones. After Gingerbread, every version of Android that's in current use targeted both cell phones and tablets. But Gingerbread added a concurrent garbage collector, video and audio improvements, NFC, or near-field communication, and enhancements to the clipboard. So around this time, Android tablets started appearing, and the next version of Android, Honeycomb, or version 3, came along in February of 2011. It was specifically optimized for tablets, and it included the new Fragments API, the Action Bar, which is very important to modern Android apps, and much, much more. The Honeycomb operating system really only worked on tablets, and for a short time, Developers had to build for two distinct operating systems, Gingerbread for phones and Honeycomb for tablets. And that was the case until Ice Cream Sandwich came along in October of 2011. Ice Cream Sandwich, or version 4, unified the SDKs for tablets and smartphones and added improved audio support and a customizable launcher environment. Moving along, we come to the three releases known as Jelly Bean. Version 4.1 improved performance and was known as Project Butter, as in smooth like butter. Version 4.2, released in November 2012, improved camera support, added multi-user support on tablets, and added a unified interface layout engine. And then 4.3, which came along in the summer of 2013, added Bluetooth low energy, improved gaming graphics, and more. Android 4.4, or KitKat, was released in October 2013. It added significant new tools for memory and power management, with the ultimate goal of having a single operating system that would work on both modern tablets and phones, and on less costly, low-powered, low-memory devices. Version 4.4 also introduced improvements for NFC, new frameworks for printing and managing storage, the ability to designate an application as a default SMS receiver, rich media functionality, accessibility, and much, much more. And finally, Android 5, Lollipop, appeared in November 2014. It included a complete visual overhaul of Android with the material design language. It also implemented a new battery saver feature, improvements to notifications, security, device sharing, quick settings access, and much more. But just as important to developers, it included a completely new runtime named ART for Android runtime. ART changes from a just-in-time compilation model to compile on installation, theoretically improving initial startup times for all Android apps. And that's the history of Android up to the present day. Regardless of which version of Android you're targeting for your app development, it's important to know the history of the operating system and of the platform of which it's a part. Android developers need at least a basic understanding of the architecture of the operating system and the rest of the platform. Android is designed around a kernel that's based on Linux. It's a version of Linux that's highly optimized for mobile operating systems, and it's made as small as possible so that it works well on devices that have constrained CPU and memory capabilities. On top of the kernel is the Android runtime and a set of libraries that enable the operating system's behaviors. The next level is the application framework, which sits on top of the Android runtime and the associated libraries. And then finally, at the top, are the apps, including those that are included with the operating system 
and those that the user installs. Let's break down each of these layers. The Linux kernel, again, starts with Linux itself, but then also has a set of drivers. Each driver interfaces with some aspect of the Android device. There are drivers for audio, camera, display, the keypad, to manage flash memory, power, Wi-Fi, and so on. It's up to the OEMs, that is, the manufacturers of the devices, to customize these drivers and to make them work for their devices. So, if you're holding an Android device in your hand, the version of Android that's on that device will be a combination of what Google delivers and what the vendor delivers. This is even true of the Nexus devices, because they're all manufactured by specific vendors. Asus, LG, Motorola, or HTC. The next layer is the Android runtime. This includes a set of core libraries and, critically, the virtual machine. Android 4.4 and prior versions use a virtual machine named Dalvik. In Android 5, Dalvik is replaced by a new virtual machine simply named Art for Android runtime. Art was introduced experimentally in KitKat and completely replaced Dalvik in Lollipop. Art uses a ahead-of-time compilation instead of the just-in-time model used in Dalvik. That means that apps are compiled into machine code upon installation, rather than waiting until features are used for the first time. As a result, apps run a bit faster under Art, all other things being equal. Art also has improved garbage collection, so you see fewer pauses and stutters in low-memory environments. To compile an app, you use the compiler that's included with the Android SDK. The associated libraries in the SDK include libraries to manage all sorts of features of Android, including graphics, databases, encryption, typefaces, and so on. These libraries work at the same level of the software stack as the core runtime, so they're expandable. And device makers can add their own libraries to this layer. The next level is the application framework. It has modules for controlling all the different components of your apps. This includes activities, which represent the screens that the user sees, and content providers to manage data and move that data between apps. Locations, notifications, windows, resources, telephone management, and so on. And finally, there are the apps. Each version of Android, as packaged by Google, has been delivered with an expanded set of default apps. If a device is licensed to use Google services, such as the Google Play Store, it'll have Gmail, Hangouts, Google Maps, and so on. Devices that use customized versions of Android, such as Amazon's Kindle Fire lineup, will have their own versions of these apps. But at minimum, every version of Android typically has a home screen or a launcher screen, a web browser, contact and calendar management, phone and camera management, and more. Starting with Android 4.4, or KitKat, a full productivity suite was included. And Android 5, Lollipop, added an exercise monitoring app. More and more standard apps are included with each new version of the operating system. But you can add as many apps to this layer as you want including both those apps that you can get from the app stores, but also apps that you build yourself. As a developer, you'll be putting together your apps using components. There are a number of major types of components. Activities represent the screens, what the user sees. A single activity can either take up an entire screen or a portion of a screen on devices that can display more than one app at the same time. Each activity is represented by a Java class in your Android project. But what the user sees is just an application screen. A visual control, known as a view, is a smaller component. Technically, activities are also views, but here I'm talking about things like text boxes and buttons. Each view can be used to manage display and user interactivity. Most screens include multiple views, and the views are arranged on the screen using a layout container. So activities contain layouts, 
and layouts contain views. Services are a special kind of component that performs a background job. Services by their nature are invisible. The user doesn't see them, but they can run in the background even while the user is running an app in the foreground. Broadcast receivers react to system messages, messages that are dispatched by the operating system and by other apps. And content providers provide managed access to data with interfaces that let apps exchange data with each other on a device. Many content providers are included in a default Android installation, and you can build your own custom content providers for your own apps. Not every app will use all of these platform elements. The simplest business apps might use data storage and simple input and output, while more complex apps might incorporate background services, content providers, and other more complex features. It's up to you as the developer to decide what your app needs and what elements of the platform you need to use. Each component in an Android app is implemented as a Java class. Custom apps use both the Java classes that are included in the SDK and your own custom Java classes. Here's an example. An activity represents a screen or a portion of a screen in an Android app, and it's an instance of a Java class named android.app.activity. And here's another example, a button. When you add a button to a screen, it's because you want the user to be able to touch or click it. And a button in Android is an instance of a Java class named android.widget.button. This just scratches the surface. There are thousands of different Java classes and interfaces in the Android SDK. And you'll be creating your own Java classes to represent your app's components. Because you'll be working with Java, it's important to understand which version you'll be coding for. The compiler that builds bytecode for the Android runtime uses an Android-specific Java implementation. It doesn't map precisely to any specific version of Oracle's Java. Instead, you'll find that Android's implementation of Java uses primarily Java 5 and 6 APIs and syntax with support for some, but not all of the syntax enhancements that were introduced in Java 7. As of the time of this recording, features that were introduced with Java 8, such as Lambda expressions and the new date time API, are not available in Android. Java 7 introduced support for new syntax that can really speed up your coding. Here's what's supported in Android as of Android 5, or Lollipop. The diamond operator lets you instantiate collections and other interfaces that use generic data typing without having to declare the generic type twice. Prior to Java 7, this statement would have needed the string declaration again in the constructor method call. In Java 7, it's implied, so you only have to declare it once and if you need to change it, you only need to change it once. Android also supports evaluating string-based values with the switch statement, declaring catch clauses that can handle more than one exception type, and using the underscore character to improve readability of long numeric literals. Here are some things you can't do in your Android code. The try with resources clause that supports automatic closing of objects that support an interface named Closable is only supported starting with Android 4.4. So unless you want to declare a minimum SDK of a very recent version of the operating system so that your app can't be used on those older devices, you won't be able to use this syntax. And Android also doesn't support the safe var args annotation that can be used in Java 7 to suppress certain warnings of potentially unsafe parameter declarations. This is a less used feature of Java 7 and less likely to be missed. When you compile your Java code in an Android app, it goes through a number of stages. Your custom code and pre-compiled classes from runtime and custom libraries are compiled first by the standard Java compiler named Java C. That's why you need the full Java Developer Kit, or JDK, installed. You need the compiler that it provides. Java C outputs a set of Java bytecode files with the extension 
dot class. So far, this looks just like any Java compiler process. But what happens next is unique to Android. The next step is optional. You can take those Java bytecode files and send them through a tool named ProGuard. ProGuard will minimize and obfuscate your code. It's disabled by default in new Android projects that you might create in Android Studio, but when ProGuard is turned on, it'll analyze your code and remove implementations of methods, for example, that aren't called. It can dramatically shrink your distributable app package, and it can also obfuscate your code, changing method names and so on to make it harder to decompile the package's Java code. Regardless of whether you use ProGuard, you'll once again end up with class files, Java bytecode files. The next step is to turn those files into something called DEX bytecode. This is a format that's optimized for Android and can be executed by both the older Dalvik runtime and the newer Art runtime. DEX files are what you distribute in your application package. The device's runtime reads those files and then recompile some of them into machine code for the fastest possible execution. On Dalvik, this step happens as the app runs, using just-in-time or JIT architecture. On the newer art, the recompilation happens when the app is first installed, meaning that the app can run faster when the user runs it on the device. And that's how your Java code gets turned into something that runs on Android. It starts as pure Java, and through a couple of steps, it's transformed into something the Android runtime can read and execute.